Um, so yeah, Collins already did my introduction, which is fine. Uh, but I kind of plan to introduce myself. But okay, so I saw that Ruler Rain was barefoot, and I was like, I only wear shoes when people ask me to. So I'm gonna go barefoot, because why not? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and so I'm also going to give a little introduction about myself, um, mostly because I want to like get to know y'all more, so I don't feel as nervous. So yeah, I'm Jake, uh, junior at CMC. I'm really afraid of bugs, like the flying beetles that people claim are blind. They're not blind. <laughs> they have it out for me, I swear. <laughs> um, yeah, from Orange County. Orange County is better than LA, and I'll die on that hill. Um, okay, with that, uh, I'm going to get into my talk, Who Am I? Exploring the roots of our value and identity and rejecting ambition as worth. Um, yeah, uh, so when I entered college, and I think this is true for all of us, um, I was given all of this freedom and I had absolutely no idea what to do with it. I had no clue how to fill my time. I would just go to class, come back, and that was it. Like, obviously that's not fun. Uh, I went to a Catholic school up until that point, so I didn't have to wear a uniform. I didn't have to be home by 10. I didn't even have to go to class if I didn't want to, and I didn't want to, so I did it. Um, I got to do all the things I wanted to do, and I got to do them when I wanted to do them. And so I was kind of free to answer this question of who is Jake for the first time ever. Um, it's something I thought about a lot during this period as I was actively constructing a picture of what I wanted to be during my time in college. What sorts of things I wanted to do, what sorts of classes did I want to take, what kind of friends did I want to make. Um, it's these kind of questions that I'm going to explore in this talk, and I'm going to look at the outside forces that kind of affect our answers to these questions. So people generally ask the question of who am I all the time? Am I the kind of person that does this kind of work? Am I the person that uh, feels this kind of way? Am I the kind of person that steals the last cookie at dinner? Uh, I argue that it's good to ask questions like these, uh, that all of us are more or less in a constant state of developing and reconsidering ourselves, redefining ourselves in the way we want to. Uh, so now this ties into ambition because when we're asking ourselves the question of who we are, um, we often think about what we want our future to look like. Um, I have an example. So everybody here has been in an interview at some point in their life. And usually the first question that the interviewer asks is, so tell me about yourself. It's a really vague question that I don't really like. It's such a weird way to start a conversation. So why do people do it for interviews? Um, anyways. All of us have kind of um, constructed elevator pitches to kind of answer this question. Um, and I noticed that um, when we're constructing our elevator pitches, we highlight our past work experiences, the current stuff we're working on, and usually we talk about what we want our future to look like. So for me, I always say, oh, I went to Catholic school, I'm at CMC now setting blah, 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 and I want to go to law school in the, uh, at the end of the day. Uh, I was on the interview another day, uh, and I did my whole spiel about research and jobs on campus and all that. Uh, and even go to law school, the whole shebang. Um, and so it's kind of ingrained in us that interviews, uh, no matter what kind of interview it is, you need to brag about your jobs and you need to have really big dreams and whatever, which I'm all for having big dreams. Bragging, like, not so much. Uh, but I wanted to ask, why is ambition treated as such a virtue? And what does that mean for how we answer the question, who am I? It seems that, um, at the Claremont Colleges at least, it's easy to feel that in order to deserve our spot on campus, uh, someone needs to do research or join a consulting club or get A's in all of their classes, win some award, uh, and at the end of the day, get a really cushy job that pays really well um, in some city that you've never been to before. <laughs> it seems that uh, if you're not ambitious enough, if ambition isn't a salient enough part of your identity, that you'll be out of place, that if you don't do all these things, it's easy to answer the question of who am I as being not enough. You're not smart enough, you're not courageous enough, you're not ambitious enough. But wait, there's more. <laughs> so in the next few minutes, I'm gonna, talk, uh, I'm gonna look at what the Bible tells us about ambition, as well as how we can get uh, our own idea of individual self-worth. I see a few of you right now questioning what I'm gonna do with this thing and how we can actually apply this to our daily lives, but I'm getting there, okay? Like, just <laughs> trust me. Yeah, so this is the um, structure of my talk. Um, so very quickly, uh, I want us to kind of get a groundwork for where we all think about ambition right now. So take a minute or two, talk to a partner about what we think ambition is. All right, all right, I'm gonna bring us back together. I hope you guys continue these conversations later, but what are some of the things that you guys came up with about what ambition means to you? Yeah? Yeah, that's good. What was it? Striving. 
striving. striving. <laughs> Trying to achieve. Yeah, that's good. An animating desire for more. Wait, can you repeat that last? An animating desire for more. Ooh, that's a good one. An animating desire for more. Okay, yeah, I think these are all like really good definitions of ambition. Um, but just to kind of like see what the world thinks of ambition, uh, I found this picture online. Uh, it tells uh, about the costs, quote unquote, of ambition. Uh, it's like a Tumblr post from 2008. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the cost of ambition, late nights, early mornings, lots of associates, very few friends. You'll often be misunderstood. You'll be single unless you're lucky enough to find someone who understands your lifestyle. People will all want you to do good, but never better than them. Um, and for this reason, you will do many things alone. Um, I thought about this a lot, and I just kind of want to say that this kind of life sucks. <laughs> like, like I, I think it's from Tumblr, I don't know, but I'm not sure I want to sacrifice any of these things um, for ambition. Like, I want friends. I want people to understand who I am. Like, am I willing to sacrifice all these things just so that I can have a good title at some job? Let's see what the Bible says, though. So Proverbs uh, chapter 10, verse 4 says, Lazy hands make for poverty, but diligent hands bring wealth. I think this is a good view of what ambition can be. I think God wants us to work hard for the things that we want in life and for us to avoid being lazy. Now, I wanted to touch a bit on the historical uh, context around this passage. How would, it, uh, how would this passage have been received by its Jewish audience over 2,000 years ago? First of all, most people at the time were poor farmers or tradespeople, so hard work and laziness had real consequences for them. But the word diligent here really stands out to me. To them, lazy hands didn't just mean laziness, uh, but rather completing your work without regard or passion. It is to not find meaning in your work. However, diligence isn't just a placeholder word, um, and diligent hands does not just mean doing a job well. It literally means finding a meaning for the work you do um, and to find happiness in the work you're doing. It means to work for other reasons than just yourself. Um, Ecclesiastes says this too. Um, in Ecclesiastes it says, I know that there is nothing better for people than to be happy and to do good while they live. I think this is a concept of life that we don't really think about a lot anymore. We kind of think that we need to sacrifice 40 years of our life to retire at the age of 70, I don't know, maybe 80 in a couple years. <laughs> and I don't want that. Uh, Matthew chapter 7, verse 7 through 8 says, And I ask and, it will, or, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives, and the one who seeks, finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. I think this is another example of good ambition. These verses may primarily refer to a kind of spiritual seeking, but notice that that's not only what they say. I think this means God wants all of us to bring all of our needs and hopes to him. There's a way that God wants to work with us. God will not help us, nor will the world, if we don't actively want the things we want from life. Um, what we do when we want something, or what do we do when we want something? We work for it, and God wants us to work for it. Of course, he can do his thing and give us anything he wants with the snap of his fingers, but he asks us to work for the things we want, and soon they will be ours. It is good, even encouraged, to want more from life. Uh, this doesn't mean that God always gives us exactly what we want. God might sometimes give us something different or show us a new direction to go, but we should at least try. However, things get a bit different when we get to James chapter 3, verse 16. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you will find disorder and every evil practice. So this gets a bit complicated. In the first two examples, ambition is seen as some positive thing that brings wealth and satisfaction. But here, James specifies an enviable and selfish ambition um, that brings disorder into your life. So it seems that ambition, as it is commonly understood, that being a want to do well in life is only good if it's a selfless ambition, not a selfish ambition. This feels like a challenge to a lot of the ambition we experience here on campus. Um, is it possible to be ambitious um, in a way that isn't envious or selfish? And what does that look like? I think it is possible to have ambition that's selfless, that's more than just yourself, um, that has um, impacts on other people that aren't you. Um, and so take a few minutes and talk about what this means for you in the same partners from before. That's what I'm saying. All right, let's gather us back up together. <laughs> Thanks, Tina, for letting me know when to bring it. <laughs> okay, um, so what did you guys talk about? How does the phrase selfish or selfless ambition apply to you, or how should it apply to you? Personally, like, 
personally, I'm like really ambitious and really passionate about mentoring like up or underclassmen. Um, so if someone who's like interested in finance uh, uh, and is really like trying to recruit or something and needs some help, like I'll I'll like pick up the phone and call them, whether that be like people from my high school who like email me, <laughs> but like also like people at CMC who are uh, going through that process that I went through last semester. Um, so I just like try to give as much advice as possible because um, I really think it's a really difficult process. So I want to like alleviate that as much as possible. Yeah, I think that's a really good take on the world to have. Um, to want to mentor other people to help them get to the same place you are, you know, um, get your foot in the door, then hold it open for others. Uh, is there any uh, anybody else want to share their thoughts? Yeah. I would think of selfless ambition as a desire to achieve something that is not self-aggrandizement or is not directly beneficial to oneself. You know, a desire to cure a disease, for instance, would be a sort of selfless ambition. Yeah, that's really great. Uh, I also want to shout out Chris and Lorraine for doing CCF, which I think would be selfless ambition. <laughs> Okay, um, right now I wanted to kind of uh, transition to how we get our own individual idea of self-worth and how we can rethink it to be more in line with this new understanding of selfless ambition. So I googled some prestigious careers uh, and these are the first results that came up. So like lawyer, architect, uh, dentist, physician, uh, you know, these are the careers that Google thinks are prestigious. Um, <laughs> Okay, yes, some of us are on there, whatever. <laughs> uh, but I noticed that all these careers um, are relatively high paying, uh, require some sort of advanced education, and most work in big office buildings. Careers such as these, however, do have the possibility to become someone's life and take up all their time uh, that could be used for family, for friends, for relaxation. So we must ask ourselves why these careers are so popular. Uh, of course, you can find some sort of fulfillment in any of these careers. Like I know Ingrid really likes finance. Finance isn't up here for whatever reason, but I think that's a good reason to do finance in and of itself. But if you don't feel that fulfillment in doing one of these prestigious careers, why are we considered less than? Why are we considered complacent for just wanting an average life? Um, one approach to healthy ambition might be to find careers that just fulfill you, uh, that speak to some sense of who you are as a person. Of course, it's no shame to do a job to make money when you're young. And it's no shame either to work a minimum wage job well into your 30s or 40s. Uh, but something, uh, you need to do something that one, you find a sense of fulfillment in, and two, allows you to live life as you please. Uh, now, I know this is getting into career advice with Jake, uh, but I just wanted to add one more thing. None of the jobs that Google considers prestigious existed a thousand years ago. Well, some of them did, but my point is, <laughs> New careers pop up all the time. The jobs that all of us are going to have in 10, 20, 30 years even probably don't exist yet. So be patient, truly explore, find your passion, and you'll discover something that you truly enjoy. All right, so now we're going to get into like the real bread and butter of this talk. How we can find ambition outside, or how we can find identity rather, outside of our ambition. Of course, this can go both ways. We feel great about ourselves when we achieve something important, such as getting into the Claremont Colleges. Uh, I still remember the day that I found out I'd be going to CMC, um, the culmination of my educational journey for 17 years. Um, I was sitting at the dining table in my home in Orange County, uh, just refreshing my laptop every 10 seconds, um, waiting for the application portal to update. Um, then at exactly 5.02 p.m. on December 15th, 2020, um, I saw a new message was posted, and I discovered I got into CMC, there was like confettis and everything, I almost tackled my mom when I found out. Um, I started shouting, CMC, CMC, <laughs> yep. Uh, anyways, uh, that story was a little bit different when I got to campus. Of course, the five C's are hecka competitive, and I knew this going into it. I wanted to be a part of this competition. I wanted to join all the research institutes, all the clubs, and my freshman year, I spent hours in the computer lab working on my resume and all the applications. Um, and I sent them off during my first week of class. Uh, I checked, I sent out 11 applications that first year. Um, uh, I went back through my emails and counted. Uh, and so you think I would have gotten one, right? Like at least one? Well, no. Uh, I started my third week of college with 11 rejection emails. And I took that to heart. I shouldn't have, but I did. I felt a little shit, to be perfectly honest. Uh, quite shit. Uh, it's weird to be put into a position where you got into a school such as this, 
but you aren't um, good enough to get into one of the research centers that you hoped for. It makes you feel like you failed. A reading from Psalm 37, 23. Though he may stumble, he will not fall, for the Lord upholds him with his hand. We will not, we cannot fail with the Lord by our side. From 2 Corinthians 12, 9 through 10. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weakness, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. What I want us to take away from this is our failures don't define us, nor do they make us weak. They make us stronger. They add useful substance to all of our journeys. The appropriate response to failure is not to mark against yourselves, but rather invite the failure to make you better, to make you happier, to make you a truer version of yourself. For when we invite failure to build us up, we invite God to make us more worthy. It is not our failures that gives us identity, but rather how we respond to that failure that gives us strength. Okay, Penny Finitor, it's just Latin for I'm almost done. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, we began this talk on exploring ambition, and we learned that ambition has two sides, more or less. A selfless, righteous ambition that seeks not to only lift yourself up, but those around you as well. This is the good side of ambition, the ambition that the Lord wants you to have. The other side, however, is the bad side of ambition, um, where you become selfish, hyper-focused on a singular goal that is not in line with their values, that is wholly for yourself, not for anyone else, not even God. Then we talked about worth, how our ideas of worth come from relatively outdated understandings of careers and prestige, how we'd rather find ourselves um, doing something worthful that fulfills us. Um, doing things that makes us happy is worthwhile, and it's worthy. And we should all strive to seek a balance between our good ambition and doing things because we like to do them, not because Google says they're prestigious. <laughs> and finally, we talked about how we can find identity through our struggles in finding self-worth. Uh, we talked about how our failures do not define us, um, but how they come to inspire us. How ambition, worth, identity all tie together to create a self-portrait of ourselves. Um, after the talk, I hope you all continue this conversation about identifying yourself as who you are and giving yourself worthiness during the Keynes dinner in a little bit. Um, and I hope you got as much out of this talk as I did. Um, before I end, I wanted to end with a quote I found a while back that I think really touches on a lot of the points I made in this talk. It's by a guy named Grantland Rice. He's not really speaking in any religious capacity, um, but I really like the quote anyhow. Um, For when the one great scorer comes to mark against your name, he writes, not whether you've won or, uh, won or lost, but rather how you played the game. It's easy to associate having the nicest house, the cushiest job, the best salary or whatever, with having won at life. You did all the things um, everyone has ever told you, and then you did them well enough to afford yourself comfort. But to me, and probably to God as well, this is not as important as what you actually did with your life. How do you find meaning in life? What are the things that you do to make life better for others? And in a sense, how do you play the game? Um, I want everyone to think about this as they leave this talk today, and I want you all to consider how you can play your game. Um, all right, so we're gonna end with one last group discussion, so please turn to the people around you and share what you thought of this talk or what you thought was the most important part.